right now all around the world. Uh, before uh, I gave you uh, mic and you preach the word of God, I will pray in Urdu language. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. خداوند رب الفاج لشکروں کے خدا آسمان اور زمین کے خالق تیری شکر گزاری کرتے ہیں آج کی اس خوبصورت دن کے لیے خداوند خداوند تیری بیٹی کے لیے تیرا شکر ادا کرتے ہیں جن کو تو اپنے جلال کے لیے کثرت کے ساتھ استعمال کر آج تیری بیٹی کا کلام کو بیان کرنا دعا کرنا تیرے جلال اور برکت کا ثواب بنے اور اسی طرح بہت ساری لوگوں کو بچانے کا ثواب اور وسیلہ بنے اور میٹنگ کا سارا جلال تیرے بیٹے ہمارے خداوند یہ سوچی پاک رو تیرا شکر تیری تعریف ہو تیرے زندہ جلالی اور فتح منگ نام سے یہ مانگتے اور پا لیتے ہیں آمین آمین لارڈ سو فاسٹر سزین وانس اگین آئی ویلکم یو سو آئی وڈ لائک ٹو ریکویسٹ یو گو ہیڈ اینڈ شیئر دا ورڈ آف گاڈ دا لارڈ پٹ ان یور ہارٹ پریز گاڈ تھینک یو سو مچ پاسٹر ویل ٹوڈے وی گن ٹاک اباؤٹ دا سیکرٹ سو ٹریجر Whenever I hear that word treasure, I almost immediately think about pirates. I don't know about you, but I always do. And, and they have this secret map with a big X on it that marks the spot where the treasure lies. And what is this treasure? Well, it's almost always gold and jewels. Gold was very precious and greatly desired, and it still is today. The pursuit of the treasure became the pirate's life's work. It was dangerous. It took a lot of time and energy just to get to that mysterious place where the treasure was hidden. But once they found that spot, there was still the hard work of uncovering it. But to the pirates, it was well worth the effort. Treasure, hidden treasure. And the word of God speaks about hidden treasure. Proverbs 25, 2 tells us that it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the glory of kings to search them out. And Proverbs 2, 1 tells us that to turn our ear to wisdom, to apply our heart to understanding, to look for it as silver and search for it as hidden treasure. And we're going to be doing some of that tonight as we're seeking wisdom and understanding and digging for treasure in the word of God. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So what do these two scriptures from Proverbs and a pirate on a treasure hunt have in common? Well, hard work, diligence, discipline, and perseverance. You see, the treasure is always greatly desired, but to acquire it, you've got to make some effort. And when dealing with our spiritual walk, it's a lifelong commitment. Sometimes, when correctly handling the Word of God, we who've been raised in church or we've been believers for a long time, we tend to become what I like to call scriptural cherry pickers. And what I mean by that is that we pick the plump, juicy Bible verses, the ones that suit us or our situation at that moment, or they, they match our agenda, our frame of mind, or the current crisis that we might find ourselves in. We pick them out of context and we liberally apply them to whatever the need is. And most of us are probably guilty of doing this and, and there's nothing wrong with doing it. It's just that there's so much more that God wants to give and to show us in the whole context of that passage than just that verse that we want to randomly pull out and use. So some time ago I was reading a devotional and the verse of the day was one that I like to cherry pick quite often, but something jumped out at me. I saw this verse very differently in a different context than the one I always would attribute it to. And then as I opened up my own Bible for my personal devotions that day in the reading, it was in the book of Philippians. And this verse also showed up exactly where my bookmark had been placed the day before. So I think that was confirmation that Holy Spirit wanted me to check this out and get a little clearer understanding of what he wanted to convey. So how many of us realize that the word of God is living 
As our maturity grows in Christ, so does the substance, the revelation that God allows us to pull out of his word. God's word is always, always, always a now, a today word. It's always relevant. Just oftentimes when we're partaking of it, we're only eating like the baby food, the mashed carrots. But God wants us to be dining on the meat that goes with them. So, however, this is going to require something from us. It's going to require a desire for us to use our spiritual teeth to chew it up. But most importantly, it's going to require discipline to do it. So I want us to read today from a familiar passage of Paul's that's loaded with plump, juicy, scriptural cherries. And I'm going to be reading from the book of Philippians chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 4 through 19. It's a kind of a lengthy passage, but it's packed full, so I don't want you to miss any of this. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you as Philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving or receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering and acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Now, what I want to talk about is God our Father saying to us, his beloved children, don't be limited by your present knowledge, but move in, come closer and learn more about me. Now, that sounds fantastic on the outside, but as with everything else in our walk, it will always cost you something. So what does it mean to be limited by our understanding? Well, we just read in Proverbs 2 that the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So how can we be limited? Laziness, lack of discipline, wrong priorities. If he gives and we don't have it, whose fault is that? Well, the fault is our own. Time and treasure is telling. In the Old Testament book of Exodus, we see that God demanded the firstborn son and the first fruits to be dedicated to him. So what or who we spend our time and treasure on is very indicative of why we may have a lack of understanding, especially when it comes to spiritual matters. Because if we don't dedicate time for it or put effort into cultivating any type of relationship, it ends up being shallow and very unsatisfactory. You can never really know or understand someone without investing time. And the more time that's invested, the more dedicated you are and the deeper that that relationship becomes. And isn't that what we all want anyway? But it also requires movement to promote growth. We can't stay static. It's called a Christian walk for a reason. It's a lifestyle. 
It requires desire, the right heart, the correct motivations behind the heart. So are you seeking power, the gifts, the signs and wonders only? Or are you seeking the salvation, the freedom, and the whole restoration of the body? Are you seeking to know him just because it's him that you get to know? So what should we do and how do we proceed? Well, the first place we need to start is with a sort of replacement theology. We need to remove the God of self off of the thrones of our heart where our minds and our hearts are focused upon ourselves, our drama, our relationships, our jobs, our finances, our sickness, our kids, our comfort, our convenience. When we are self-focused, we're often problem focused. Now, the way I see it is we're like this little tiny Lego person here. We can snap on and off the head of our choosing whenever we feel like it. Sometimes it's me and sometimes it's God. It depends on the second, the minute, the hour, the day, the month, the year, the particular season or crisis that I find myself in. And then when we go into our prayer closet, well, we take off our head and then we snap on the God head. And then we spend time in his word and in fellowship with him. And we give him our burdens with our prayers and our petitions and our heart of thanksgiving. And the peace comes. But immediately when we leave that place of sanctuary, it seems like we take his head off again. And then we put our head back on again. Our focus reverts back to our own problems on how we're going to solve them or fix them. And that's where all the anxiety comes in. We need to remove self and permanently replace it with Jehovah Rapha. He's our healer. Or Jehovah Nisi. He's our covering. Or Jehovah Bel Perazim. He's the God of the breakthrough or Jeho Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider or Jehovah Shalom. He's the God of our peace. These are just a few of the many, many names that are really attributes of a multifaceted, multidimensional God that we need to move closer to. And next, we begin the process of knowing him. We are encouraged throughout scripture to do just that. The scriptures tells us to taste and see that the Lord is good, to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, to ask, seek, knock, your word have I hidden in my heart, learn of me for I'm meek and lowly, seek, look, listen, knock, search, mine, study, taste, all of these help us to know him, but they all require effort, work, discipline. It's not just extra unnecessary knowledge. The Father has a really excellent reason for it. So we're going to continue. When Paul was concluding his letter to the Philippians, he's encouraging them to rejoice in the Lord. Now, he doesn't give us any indication that something wonderful has happened. They didn't just pay off a church mortgage or win the lottery. He says it again, doubling down, so to speak. He says, rejoice. And then he transitions into, don't be anxious about anything. Now, why would he say that? Because it sounds like the folks at Philippi were just like the folks in your city and in mine. They dealt with situations in their lives that robbed them of their peace. Proverbs 23, 7 says that, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what you focus your thoughts on will eventually manifest into your actions. Paul knows this, and that's why he's in verse 8, redirecting the mind back to God. What you've learned about him, what you've learned about his character. So you take, take your mind and you think about whatever things that are noble, whatever things are pure, whatever's lovely, what's ever admirable. If anything is excellent, if anything is praiseworthy, think about those things. Fill your mind, redirect your thoughts. Take them captive if necessary. Focus on good and focus on God in every situation. By prayer, petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Meditate on his word. Meditate on his attributes, his glory, his grace, his love. And as you think on these things, 
Well, the natural byproduct of this will in be an increase in your joy. It'll be an increase in your love and in your faith because how can you not think about the one that you love and not feel these things? And then the natural obvious action or the overflow will be acts, both physical and spiritual acts, like in the book of acts type of action. Your love, your faith, your joy, it's going to propel you into action. You want the world to know and you want the world to share your joy. You want them to understand the security that you now found in the one that you love. Now, the opposite of peace is feeling anxious or fearful. And it comes from feeling insecure or out of control, not knowing what the outcome or, or feeling powerless to fix it or make something happen. This environment, it promotes an absence of peace and it opens up a gateway for the enemy to overwhelm you. And that is what's so great about this chapter in Philippians. The whole purpose of it, at least in my opinion, is to show us a tried and true strategy that Paul has learned to utilize during his own personal Christian walk. And he's so confident in what he's learned, he boldly challenges us to put it into practice. I love that. He's so confident that his life is lining up with Christ that it's an acceptable model of Christ-like living. And he encourages us to grab hold of anything that we've received from him by either word or deed or experience and begin to put that into practice. Now, wouldn't you want your life to, to be lived that way too? That you could just say with a pure heart and conviction, imitate me just like I'm imitating Christ. Because Paul said just that in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. So working towards that end goal, that should be all of our objectives. And, and just like a veteran soldier or a veteran mechanic or a pilot or a doctor or even a parent would tell a, an, in, an inexperienced brand newbie who's coming into that profession or into that, that position, they would say, this is now your chosen vocation. This is your calling. You can expect some really great things, but you can also expect some really difficult challenges. But here's what I've learned over the course of my life's work. We need to apply and model what we ourselves have learned. And the word learned comes from the same Greek word where we get the word disciple from. It means to learn the secret of something through personal experience. Just like the disciples learn through their personal experience with shadowing Christ. They were witnesses. They watched and they learned. So what Paul is getting ready to expound on in verses 9 through 19, it's not just a quick revelation or something that was casually experienced. It's the kind of learning that time, energy, and application of different methods through trial and error gives birth to. And once it's learned, it's not going to be unlearned. Things like your multiplication tables or driving a car or navigating a river or starting a business, living a Christian life, they're all filled with opportunities for learning. So here in these concluding verses of chapter 4, Paul is giving us the benefit and the wisdom of his trailblazing. He starts it out, and I'm going to paraphrase this in modern English so it kind of brings it home. He says, breathe smile, then breathe again. You really don't need to worry. You see, I get it. I know how you must be feeling right now because I've been there too. And it's super easy to be all in when you're in a time of plenty and you're walking in victory. But I want to let you in on a secret. Remember, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the glory of a king to search them out. Well, I am a king and a priest, according to Revelations 1, 6, and so are you. And this is what I discovered in the searching. Even in your frustration and times when you feel depleted and your back's against the wall, you can still be all in. You still have something to give, whether it's spiritually, physically, financially, emotionally. And do you know why? I do. I know because I have learned the secret, and I'm going to share it with you right now. The secret to being content with the circumstances in which you find yourself now in is Christ, who lives in me, who gives me the ability and the strength. It all comes from him. 
He's the originator, the headwaters, the source, but it flows through me. Therefore, it's not determinant on my own circumstances or my own abilities. It's all on him. And so I grab hold of that little world word and it's all on him and my desire to open up my life and let it flow out of me. It operates just like a canal lock because a boat doesn't get from point A to point B until the lock is opened and the water is allowed to flood in. And only then is the boat able to float out of the lock and down into the canal. Because I have this desire to allow him to flow out of me, regardless of my natural abilities, he will supernaturally supply what I'm lacking. And I'm going to reread verse 19. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So here is a prime cherry picking verse. We always take this verse to mean financially. And yes, he can and he does. But I'm convinced there's so much more far reaching than just money. Even as we're multidimensional, he's multidimensional God. And we're made in his image, so it would be a reasonable argument. And that being said, would it not also be reasonable to believe that if he's willing to meet my need in one area of my life, wouldn't he also be willing to meet it in another? Physical needs, housing, jobs, healing, and on and on. But how about emotional needs, loneliness, fears, intimacy, validation or acceptance, or spiritual needs, salvation, revelation, faith. My God shall supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So you really can rejoice. The things that frighten you, that cause uncertainty or difficulties that you might be going through right now, you can be content and rejoice because you are no longer limited by your fear of the unknown. You're not anxious because you don't have control. Your present knowledge of the situation or the circumstance is merely a curtain that can easily be pushed away. But this requires movement. Move into the word of God. Mine it like silver. Seek out its treasures like the kings and queens that you are and pray and ponder the treasures that you uncover because it's going to bring revelation and understanding and you will not be limited by your present knowledge but you'll move in closer and learn more of your heavenly father and when you leave your prayer closet having spent time in his presence meditating on his precious word you can leave that prayer closet with an expectancy to receive because God is always working on your behalf. He's always working things out for your good. We need to look for him in that moment. Hear his voice in a song of praise. Be ready for revelation to come as he expounds on a word that he's just dropped into your spirit and be at peace knowing that he is your God He's limitless in power and resources. He's always faithful. He's always true. And he will always perform his word. Amen. Amen. So I was excited by that word. I hope that you were excited too. And I want to just take a few moments to pray for us right now. So Father God, we are so grateful for your word today. Father, we thank you for the revelation that you've given us today in the word that Lord, we can be at peace, that we can know that you're in control and that if we get into the word and we begin to learn more about you, you're going to just bring revelation, Lord, and we're going to have greater faith to be content in wherever we find ourselves, Lord, that we are going to believe for bigger and greater things for you. And Father, we will always have something to release, to give, Father, no matter what the circumstances, no matter who we come into contact with, Father God, you will give us something fresh that is going to feel that need at that moment in time. And so, Father, we just lift up those that are listening today. We lift up those that, that are suffering in their bodies, Lord, that have, have written in prayer requests, Lord God, for physical, Father, for financial, for emotional, for relational, whatever the needs are, Lord God. You 
are the great healer. You are the great provider, Lord. You are the great restorer. And Father, we invite you now into those situations that you would have your way, that you would miraculously break out into those homes, Lord God, into those hearts and those lives, Lord, and that you would do a great work in Jesus' mighty name. And that, Father, that we release the blessing upon your people, the blood of Jesus over them to surround them, to keep them, to protect them, Father God, that they would be hemmed in on every side, Lord, and that you would go before them, that, Lord, that they would not be in lack or in need, but, Father, that they would lay hold of the word that of God the promises in their Lord and they would begin to uh, walk them out in spiritual authority and that they would apply the word day by day to their life to every situation father to everything that they run into the word of God applies it is fresh it is alive and it is relevant it is a today word and so father that they would become skillful in using the word Lord God in the world today and Father, we just ask that you would um, minister to the, the government of Pakistan and the people of Pakistan, Lord, that you would just continue to pour out your love, your grace, your mercy upon that country, Lord God, that revival would break out, Lord, and would just explode in that nation and across the borders and around the world. Fire of God, come and do what needs to be done, Father God, that you would burn brightly, Lord, that it would be a place of, of wealth, of healing, Lord God, that it would be a light that shines as a beacon, Lord, that would draw others to know how great and how good and how wonderful you are, Lord, and how much you love your people. Father, we just thank you for those that are listening today that, Lord, may... Um, it, you or they may not know you at this time simply open your heart say jesus i know i'm a sinner i need a savior i invite you to come into my heart today to take away my sin become the lord of my life i believe you died for me you arose again and you are seated right now at the at the right hand of the father and lord that you have a place for me and my heart in my life lord god and you're going to use me from this day forward for your kingdom Father, we thank you for those that are coming into the kingdom, Lord. Father, for those that are still dealing with the after effects of the earthquakes, the flood, the pestilence, Lord God, that are, are dealing with those situations, Father, we just ask that you would just come alongside of them, Holy Spirit, that you would encourage, that you would guide and direct, and that you would meet every need, and Lord, that they would know you as a loving Father and in a tangible way, Lord, that you are a God supplies their needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. And Father, we release that word today. We release that word of faith, Lord God, into those situations. Lord, let it find a place to light and spring up and explode in new revelations of the goodness of God in their lives today. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this word. We ask a special blessing on Pastor Amjad, this ministry, his team, and this family. Lord God, that you would keep them, that you would provide, Father, protect, and open up more doors, Father, that they can carry the word across the world, Father. We love you, Lord. We bless you. We seal it now by the precious name, by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. amen. Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Pastor Suzanne, you preach a wonderful sermon. Really, thank we God bless. So thank you for your precious time. God bless you richly and keep you in his powerful hand. We will see you next Saturday, same time yes. in Pakistan. Take Amen. Care. Take care. God bless. Love you. Bye-bye.